So thanks everyone for joining and uh, I'm happy that Gordon was able to share some stories. I was actually thinking of uh, cr cracking a joke about policemen, but perhaps at some other time. <laughs> I, I could share though that um, in relation to the issue of the separation of powers, because I come from the Philippines, there is a very sorry state uh, in my country now, or what used to be my country, in the sense that um, there must be about there must have been about 12,000 people who have so far been killed uh, in the Philippines on the basis that they've been suspected of uh, using drugs. So just being a drug user uh, authorizes the police to, to, sh to just shoot and kill people in the Philippines. So since the new president, Rodrigo Duterte, became president in June, on June 30 of last year, he has actually authorized the police to just shoot on sight uh, anyone who's been suspected of suspected of just using drugs, not not just selling them, but using them. And so, so far, there have been about 12,000 people, drug suspects have been killed. And um, the, the worst thing was that about a week ago, somebody who was just in year 11 was actually uh, again shot dead by the police. And what's most unfortunate is that I have a number of friends in the Philippines still, and there seem to be a number of them who argue that, you know, th this isn't, what's happening in the Philippines isn't considered extrajudicial killing because it hasn't gone to the courts. And in fact, at one point, some of them were making the argument that, you know, killing of drug suspects is fine because in, in Saudi Arabia, for example, or in Singapore, a lot of uh, drug users or even drug pushers have actually been killed. But they are unable to make the distinction that as far as these executions in other countries are concerned, it's actually a result of a finding of guilt by a judge in a court of law where people are provided the opportunity to provide evidence. But in the Philippines, on mere suspicion, you know, you could get killed. And so it's a very dangerous country right now because essentially what has happened is that the police are implementing a, an order of Duterte and it is Duterte himself as kind of formulating uh, legislative policy in behalf of the legislation of the Philippines and the policemen are acting as judges. So, so it's a, it's a sorry state. So anyway, uh, okay. So Sounds just, like an episode of um, Sylvester Sloan movie, Judge Dredd. <laughs> yeah, yeah, something like that. Okay, so um, uh, this is the drop-in session and uh, I'm gonna provide you an opportunity to be uh, to ask questions or you know raise any concerns that you might have and then we will proceed with a regular tutorial at six any questions comments so far man joe i've um been reviewing some of the drop-in sessions and uh in one of them you had a very good conversation i think it might have been, even been with monique about how to um draft or identify an issue and how to actually draft the question draft mm -hmm. the issue you spoke for about five minutes Yep. I'm wondering if you wouldn't mind just going over that again, just from a slightly different angle, because um, I thought that was really helpful. Uh, you, you're talking of how to identify a legal issue. Would that be it? Yeah, and uh, you basically said, you know, uh, under the heading, I guess, what can make a statute, law, or decision yeah. unconstitutional or invalid? Then you went through a series of steps to work out how to phrase the legal issue. That's right. So let, let me begin by uh, speaking again why identifying the legal issue is crucial before I talk about how to do it. So identifying the legal issue is crucial because it actually demarcates uh, the line or the context of the discussion. So by identifying the legal issue, you're actually trying to determine what are the legal rules that should be cited or that should be researched on that will then inform uh, the, the, legal, the, the, the legal question that needs to be answered. And so therefore what it means is that if you're unable to identify the legal issue, chances are any rule or law or legal principle that you state is likely to be irrelevant. You might be citing rules that have nothing to do with the legal question or nothing to do with the legal issue. So by identifying the legal issue, you then delimit the legal rules or principles that you should be citing or discussing. So that's why it's crucial. So, how, how then do you, how do, then do you, def, uh, identify, so th that's why, you know, identify the legal, uh, identifying the legal issue is very important now. So we go to the next question, how then do you identify the legal issue? 
In relation to constitutional law, let me begin by saying that the legal issue is not the same as the legal question. So when you speak of the legal question, what often happens is that you're just simply repeating uh, what are the facts in, the, in a problem scenario. So you're saying, you know, based on these facts, this is the question, that's the legal question. But the legal issue is actually drawing from the legal question or based on the facts, the more important uh, legal principles or rules that are involved, the, the, the overarching legal rules or principles uh, that are involved. And in particular, in relation to constitutional law, what you want to ask is, is there anything that would perhaps invalidate uh, a particular piece of legislation or would make it unconstitutional or contrary to the constitution? So in, 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 a, in a shorthand, those are the two questions you would like to ask in order to distill or identify the legal issue. What is it that would make the law invalid or unconstitutional or contrary to the constitution? And by asking that question, therefore, when you look at the legal problem in constitutional law, you then wonder, can a law be unconstitutional because it might violate a key postulate of constitutional law, which could be about um, the rule of law, or it could be about uh, representative democracy, or it could be about responsible government. So these are uh, primordial, these are uh, overarching constitutional law principles that when breached can invalidate a law. Or you can ask a question, uh, so th that's one legal issue. The other legal issue that you might be able to cite is that, is it possible that the law is unconstitutional or invalid because it might violate the, uh, par uh, the partial separation of powers in Australia? Thirdly, you can say that, uh, you can ask whether, in, in relation, for example, to the tension between the Commonwealth Parliament and the state parliaments, you can ask the question of whether or not a particular law is over a subject, uh, is a subject over which uh, the, the Commonwealth Parliament has no power to legislate on. Because what we will uh, learn later on when we talk about uh, part, the powers of the Australian Parliament as well as the state parliaments, I think that's going to be next week, is that the powers of the Commonwealth or Federal Parliament are only those that are vested in it by the Constitution. So that the rest of the powers that do not belong to the Commonwealth Parliament actually belong to the State Parliament. So the Commonwealth Parliament can only legislate on those heads of power that have been vested in it by the Commonwealth Constitution. Everything else belongs to, to the state. So for example, uh, the power to legislate in relation to education or in, re in relation to natural resources or the environment, these are subjects over which uh, the Commonwealth Parliament has no power to legislate on because that has not been uh, vested in it by the Australian Commonwealth uh, Constitution. And therefore, these are subjects that uh, could only be legislated on by the state parliaments, as we will later see. So we've already, uh, so far, we've, we've talked about ways of uh, identifying the potential uh, attacks against the validity of a law. So we talked about key postulates of uh, constitutional law. We talked about the separation of powers. And uh, thirdly, we talked about uh, whether or not uh, the Commonwealth Parliament may actually have uh, the power under the Australian Constitution to legislate on a particular subject. There is a fourth way of uh, examining uh, uh, of trying to determine whether or not a law may be valid or, unconstit or uh, constitutional. And that is to ask uh, whether or not a particular law, even if it is within the power of the Commonwealth Parliament to pass, may breach uh, certain uh, express or implied freedoms under the Constitution. And we're going to examine this, I think, uh, in week 11, uh, when we talk about implied uh, political freedoms and uh, so on, or the freedom against arbitrary arrest and detention. So th that's what essentially uh, happens. The way to identify the legal issue in constitutional law is to ask yourself the question. So these, these are the facts and this is the legal question. And you, for example, ask to provide advice to a client. And the question really is, what advice would you give? 
and the question in particular is it, uh, relates to whether or not there is something that might be invalid in the law. And so you ask those questions. What can make the law unconstitutional or what can make the law objectionable on the basis of, uh, of, of the Constitution? So th those are um, four, of, four of the ways of identifying the legal issue. So you would then say that based on the facts, you could probably say that it could be unconstitutional because it might breach the separation of powers. And in, in having done that, if you have identified the legal issue, then you then cite the relevant rules. And having identified, so if you do not, in other words, if you don't know the, if you haven't identified the legal issue correctly, then there are just so many constitutional law rules and principles, and you simply can't be discussing those. You should only be discussing the legal rules and principles that inform on the legal issue. And so therefore, if you identify the legal issue, you're then able to cite the rules that inform or are relevant to the legal issue. And then uh, if you follow the IRAC format, you then uh, apply the legal rules to the facts. And then that leads you to a conclusion. So that's uh, the way you would approach it as far as constitutional law is concerned. Yeah, no, that's good. Thank you. It, it was, my query was specifically about that phrasing the issue. I'm wondering if you get a chance, if you wouldn't mind uh, putting a, a dozen or so examples together, um, just on a Word document or even on the um, question and answer, examples of legal issues that are phrased correctly. You know, obviously something that's not relevant to our assignment because that might uh, give us an unfair advantage. But uh, you know what I mean? If we're talking about, say, Section 44, which is pretty common in um, current affairs at the moment, how would you ask a question? How would you actually phrase the issue? Would you be able to do a few different examples just to get a bit of an idea about it? Because I'm personally, I'm really struggling with that. What I can actually do is to provide exemplars of uh, past answers by students. And you will then be able to see how they've identified the legal issue. Okay. I think that would be a good way of doing it. And I could probably post a few uh, over the weekend. Yep, that would be great. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Manjo, it's Gary. Gary yes. I think uh, what's also a good um, option is to read um, judgments, um, court decisions, because um, having read a couple of them for the assignments and that, the, the way the judges uh, go about setting out the facts and then identifying the legal issues and then applying the law to the legal issues and reaching a conclusion, I found the Australian judgments um, like... It's very straightforward. It, um, it, it encapsulates the issues very, uh, very well. So I, I would say I would, I'd recommend as well reading, you know, a couple of judgments just to get an, an idea of, of how to actually go about answering a question as well. I fully agree. That's a, a very uh, sensible suggestion, Gary, and I fully agree with it. I, I endorse that suggestion that you will actually get a better sense of actually how to identify the legal issue by actually going through some court cases, uh, especially the high court decisions. The only, the only uh, caveat I'd like to make, the only warning I'd like to make is that sometimes um, what the high court does is that, and if you go through the book by Ratnapala and Crow, is that they, these authors have made the observation that sometimes the, the court does not actually raise all the or identify all the key legal issues sometimes it would either deliberately or by omission fail to identify some legal issues and and then just arrive at a at a, at a decision that uh, comes up with a determination of uh, what's uh, what, what the controversy is about and you see a lot of these comments uh, that Radhapala and Crow would make. So, so in other words, as far as the high court would sometimes work, is that if they can, if they can uh, arrive at a decision or a, or, or a determination of a matter by just, by just uh, you know, meeting head on two or three legal issues, they would do so. Even if it means that they actually ignore uh, certain key constitutional law questions or legal issues. So they've done that often. 
And you'll see a lot of these examples. I'll be looking at, for example, chapters eight and nine of Ratnapal and Crow, where they've, they've said that had the high court actually uh, talked about this legal issue, then constitutional law would have been more enriched. So in some cases, uh, the high court doesn't do that because what can often happen is that uh, the, the, the courts are actually meant to only discuss legal postulates that are actually directly related to, uh, to the legal question or the factual background, so that sometimes for them to discuss other legal rules that are not germane to the facts might be what is known as obiter dictum. And, but the, the thing is, that obiter dictum actually, although it doesn't become binding because it's not really part of the decision itself, it can actually uh, be quite helpful in enlightening us on, you know, about constitutional law. So that, that is just the, the warning that we can sometimes see in that, unlike, for example, if you have an, uh, an assessment, you might be required to identify all the legal issues in a factual scenario. The high court doesn't always do that because it will take an approach which whereby they, if, for as long as they're able to uh, arrive at uh, a decision that uh, allows them to say whether a law is constitutional or not, they will do that without really discussing all the legal issues involved. Thanks, Manja. The, the other, um, sorry, I don't want to dominate the conversation. I know we're limited for time, but I just got a quick question in terms of uh, arriving at a conclusion when we deal with the question. Obviously, um, when a matter comes before court, there are, there are arguments for and against um, the matter. Um, it, it, so in, in arriving at a conclusion, would it be correct to say that provided we are able to justify our conclusion, um, that it's not a question of there's a right or a wrong answer, it's more a question of your thought process, um, how you've applied the law to the facts, and how you've arrived at a conclusion based on the, the case law, the constitutional law, the specific pieces of legislation, etc. Yes, Gary, you're, you're, you're very right there. So for as long as you've identified the legal issue, you've actually identified the proper and relevant rules that inform on the legal issue, and of course, you try to apply the rules to the facts. The conclusion that you arrive at may actually be one that is not commonly held by, by other students, or it may actually be something that I did not really consider. But if, if you've come up with an arguable conclusion, one which is backed up by the reasoning that, is, uh, that you, could, you could actually see in the application of the law to the facts, then certainly you will, you will get full credit for it. And uh, you will notice that uh, Justice Kirby, for example, in the High Court, is well known for his dissent. And in many cases, his dissents became the majority opinion. So uh, while in general, we can say that I would expect, in fact, I would probably think that there is a correct answer in the questions that I ask, meaning I would expect a specific answer according to how I know the law to be, I am open to being persuaded by a contrary answer. For as long as I said that the student has identified the legal issue properly, has identified and thoroughly identified the, the relevant rules, and uh, attempted to correctly apply the law to the facts, and then arrive at an argument uh, that leads then to the conclusion of the student, there is no, uh, there is no reason why a student should not get the full, the full marks or full credit for that. Yeah, thanks, Manja. I think it's just important for for the other students to to realize that it's not the same as a mathematical answer. There's no 100% right or wrong answer. It's, it's based on your reasoning and your justification. That's right. The the other point I'd like to make, though, and uh, is that um, w what will often happen is that the High Court will have will be a divided court in the sense that. You know, you have a majority group and some just justices who dissent. So we can see, therefore, that even as far as the High Court is concerned, there is room for disagreement. They don't agree. And you wonder, you know, if the, if the, if the justices of the High Court can seem to agree 
it must mean that there is kind of a great area of law where it's possible for, for people to argue, uh, you know, from various viewpoints. Okay, so th th that's one. However, it should equally be said that what we rely on, especially for a year one unit such as constitutional law, is that we, we, we should rely more on what is the decision of the high court, meaning the decision of a majority of the justice of, uh, justices of the high court. Because whatever is the decision of the majority of the high court is the law in Australia. So, in other words, students shouldn't be relying on the dissenting opinion to establish a case. That's possible. But you should only be able to cite the dissent if you've actually clearly articulated what the, the law is uh, on a particular case based on a decision of the majority. So it's not helpful to focus immediately on the dissent. We should stick first with what the law is, and the law is according to what the majority opinion of the, of the judges of the high court might be. Okay, now let me just see uh, some questions here from Jason. When do you expect to start handing out the results for the individual midterm assessment? So uh, it, the, the unit profile say, says that uh, I will release the results after three weeks. And in all likelihood, I will probably use up the three weeks, mainly because there are a lot of assessments to be marked. That's about over 160 uh, papers that I need to, be, to mark. And it's not just a question of marking them. I actually have to provide extensive feedback as well. So I've started doing the marking, but it is a process that takes a while. So three weeks, uh, it, based on the unit profile, is uh, what I've promised to do. And I will get it done within three weeks. Thank you for that. Other questions? Um, Manjo, sorry, um, you, you meant, I asked you the question uh, via email. Uh, you said that the end of term assessment will be for individual uh, questions. That's right. I'm, I'm not holding you to that, but um, I think in a previous drop in session, you mentioned how long we should expect to take to answer each of those questions, given that we've got 48 hours to, to answer those four questions. Yes. That's right. So, so, so how much time should we look at spending uh, per question? So the, the final take home paper is actually designed to be, to be taken as if it were an individuated exam. Okay. Or that you should be able to finish it within three hours. So I would, I would argue that that's the amount of time you should be devoting to the uh, final take home paper. So okay. you also notice that as far as the unit profile is concerned, it doesn't really indicate a word count at all. There is no word count requirement, unlike the, 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 the one we have for the midterm assessment, where it's quite clear that every single answer must comprise of about 500 to 550 words. There is no such requirement in the final take-home paper because, as I said, uh, the goal is for you to be able to finish it within three hours. So what, what it means is that as far as the way you answer the final take-home paper is concerned, it will not be as intensive in the yeah. sense that you're not really expected to do, do more research. You're probably expected to do less research than you did for the midterm assessment. So, there'll be, so it will be less intensive in the sense that there's probably less research. So top of mind is enough. In other words, by now, you should be able, you know, especially at, at some point, by the time you go to week 12, there should be some key uh, constitutional cases that will quickly come to mind. And these type of mind cases are ones that you should be able to quickly cite uh, in your answer. You should also be able to state or articulate what the, the relevant legal principles are uh, that come from those cases. So what, what is crucial is that you should be able to provide the footnotes, meaning the proper citation of those cases, and that shouldn't take too long. So having said that, it's less intensive because you don't have to do a lot of research 
And it's probably less extensive in the sense that I wouldn't really expect you to uh, be able to, you know, cite all the re relevant cases that could inform on illegal issue. Because as I said, it's actually meant to be uh, completed within, within three hours. Now, if it means that you can answer a question in, let's say, 350 words, then that's fine. What is crucial, though, is that you might properly identify all the legal issues across the, uh, the, the, all the topics that, we've dis that we would have discussed by then in constitutional law, and then articulate the relevant rules, apply the rules to the facts, and then come up with a proper conclusion. So unlike, for example, the midterm assessment where we have a cutoff point so that you don't have to talk about you know, uh, commonwealth and state parliamentary powers, or you don't have to address implied rights and freedoms. When it comes to the final assessment though, you're actually meant to identify all the key legal issues. So that's crucial there. Uh, having said that though, as I said, uh, you're not expected to intensively answer uh, the questions or extensively have to kind of uh, make sure that you've identified all the relevant cases and do a lot of research. That wouldn't be expected uh, in, the, in the final take-home paper. Uh, so a question from uh, Leone, yes. Sorry, just on that, do you want proper footnoting then? You want, because in some of the other exams that we've done take home, they haven't sort of required that. So you uh, want okay. Yeah, that's why uh, I, I can't remember, but probably footnotes are crucial as well because um, as far as the marking rubric is concerned, it does indicate that part of the formatting and language requirements would be that they should be formatting according to AGLC. But I don't, I don't think it takes up a lot of time really to do the proper footnotes according to AGLC because if, if you just Google uh, on the internet, it will give you examples of how you should be citing, for example, uh, I'll move that. things around as well. Yeah, well, I wouldn't be too. I'm sure of that. Hang on. Yeah. Just, I'm oh. just going to mute everyone. And if you want to say something, mute yourself. Okay, so, so I would expect that uh, proper footnoting should be done. And I don't really think that in relation to the final assessment, there will be a need, for example, to to cite journal articles and so on. So it's all about cases, really. More importantly, it's all about how to properly cite legislation. So if, if you're saying that it is about a commonwealth law, then you should make it a habit to put CTH in you know, open and clo clo close parentheses. Same thing with whether or not it's a state legislation. So I think those are the two things that will, that will emerge there that are important as far as footnoting is concerned. One would be the court decisions, most, most likely they're going to be high court decisions or federal court decisions. And the other one would be the proper citation of statutes. Thank you. Okay, was there anything else here? Yeah, so there's a question from Monique. Uh, will there be a revision week, some guidelines? Uh, yes, um, yes. So during the revision week, I will tell you about the topics that will most likely be assessed. So you will have, you will have advance notice of uh, what specific parts of constitutional law you should be studying more on. Um, yeah, so I, I will provide guidelines as well on most likely on how to, you know, make the best of your time when you try to do the, the final written assessment. Okay. Anything else before we start tonight's tutorial? So we're good? Okay. Nothing else so far? Okay, so I'm going to share screen now. Sorry, Manchow, are you going to stop this and uh, do a separate recording to make it easier for everybody else to? Uh, that's right. Okay, so I'm gonna end the meeting and get, go back in. I wonder if that will mean that all of you will end up dropping out. I don't really know, but I'm gonna end the meeting now and then I'll go back in so people make the distinction between the Zoom tutorial and the drop-in session. So thanks, uh, Jason, for the suggestion. I'm, I'm, I will 
I will end the meeting now that I'll come back.